This morning we're going to finish that in Jonah. And when we left Jonah, he had finally gotten to none of that when we started preaching like the Lord had told him to. Now the king had come out here and sent out a decree that the uh, and it starts in verse 8. This is about the decree here. Well, I'll start with saying. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout men of the Bible, the decree of the king, and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. So he's ordering a complete fast here for the men, for, for the people and the animals. Verse 8 says, But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mildly unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hand. So the covering with sackcloth was part of showing mourning or being solemn before the Lord here. And the way that ends, it talks about, and from the violence that is in their hand. So this has to be a reference that things were going on in the city that were vile here. And the king is ordered for all of this to be stopped. We're going to do a fast, complete fast. Everybody's going in sackcloth. Even the animals are going to be fasting and in sackcloth. Verse 9, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? So now they're worried here. You know, is the Lord going to forgive them? And verse 10 says, And God saw their works, and that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. You know, if, if somebody's upset in you, and you see a change in that person, if a person is truly sorry for what they've been doing, or, or, or at least tries to change, you know, we should have some forgiveness somewhere along the way because I believe we'd hope somebody to forgive us if we were doing something and we stopped doing it. Chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. He was told to go preach down to Nineveh to save these people. He goes down there and preaches. He sees them turning. And now he's angry. And verse 2 says, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Now it's interesting, he's sitting here angry because God has, uh, has, has changed his mind about the punishing men of it because of what they've done. They turned from their wicked ways now, and the Lord's forgiven them. And here's Jonah in the, in the next verse talks about this. Talking about when he fled the tar he fled the Tarsus. He's trying to give God an excuse for why he ran. But he says, For I knew thou art a gracious God, and merciful, and slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Well, he's saying he knows this about God, but at the same time, when God did this, it made him mad. Verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now that's upset right there. I mean, if you'd rather be dead than alive just because of this happened before you, you didn't get your way. And you're like, I just think now you're talking about a childish attitude. Verse 4. Then said the Lord, Dost thou well be angry? And it's like the Lord is asking you, are you better off? Now, there are times, it is right for us to be angry. There's a righteous anger. The Bible talks about being angry and sin and not. And there are things that are wrong, which we should, you know, point it out. This is wrong. Things to be angry about. 
But if we just flip off and handle, are we better off? Really? And the Lord is saying to him, Dost thou well again? Verse 5. So Jonah went out of the city and sat down on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth, and sat under it in the shadow, till he might see what would become of the city. Now, a booth is, is a hut. Okay. He went out there and he built a shelter. And it says he might see what would become of the city. Have you ever seen anybody do that? There'll be a situation going on with that. They'll get out just a little ways away. They really don't leave because they want to see what's going to happen here. And that's kind of with Jonah. You know, he knows that the Lord's forgiven them, but he still won't see what's going to happen here. Verse 6, And the Lord God prepared a gold and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly, exceeding glad of the Lord. And you think about, you know, any little shade out of bright sunlight is a good thing. So whenever he built this out, he didn't have a roof here. Verse 7, But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smoked the door that it withered. Now, this is obviously God doing this because this gourd showed up suddenly. It withered suddenly. And verse 8 says, And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. So he's out there, the gourd's gone, his shade's gone, but this vehement, this strong, powerful east wind, remember the east wind came out of the desert. So here's this incredibly hot wind showing up on him to the point where he came and wished in himself to die. Now I'll be honest with you. Kim's talked about it, I've talked about it with Kevin and and, and some other folks, you know, it's like, Lord, I'm ready to go. But that's up to him. Yeah. Whenever the Lord calls home, I'm going to be happy. But I've never told the Lord that it was better for me to die than to live. Because I'm blessed. I'll be honest with you. I'm blessed. I'm standing in his house this morning. I got family now. I have friends coming in later. Now, the other friends I know, the other family I know, bless. I don't, I don't live, y'all. I do. But John here, he's so upset. You know, and once again, verse 9, And God said to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry for the door? And he said, I do well to be angry, un even unto death. He's just smart off the board here. Tell him, Lord, I do well to be angry. Verse 10. Then saith the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the door for the which hast thou not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And verse 11. And should, should not I spare them? That great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. So a the, the six score thousand is 120,000 folks living in this city. So it is a big city. It takes a lot of cities to have 120,000 people in. And he ends Jonah with a question which I think is interesting because he mentions the cattle. Why should, the Lord is saying, why shouldn't I spare them when they cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand? They don't know. And also, much cattle. 
And I really find that interesting that the Lord's including the animals in this. So, here's Jonah, famous story of Jonah, and disobedience to the Lord. The Lord wanted him to go down and preach. He wouldn't go preach. So this great fish, which Jesus called the well, showed up, swallowed him, three days and three nights. And it's interesting, you know, would Jonah have known it was day and night where he was at? Somebody had to be keeping a towel on this. I know God did. So eventually Jonah prayed to the Lord out of the belly. The, the fish spit him up on dry land, hurled I mean, he had to be a pretty good heat here. All right? So he hits the ground over there. He's going to go to Nineveh now. He goes to Nineveh. He does what the Lord tells him to. And the power of the Lord is on him so strongly that the, the king gets here, and it's like the whole city is going to fast and pray and dress, dress in sackcloth, and not only are the humans going to do it, the animals are going to do it too. This is a complete fast and worship service. Everybody doing this. And when this happens, the Lord repents here, turns, and is not going to destroy them, which is what he said he was going to do. And so, uh, Jonah gets mad, he goes off, he sits by himself, and the Lord gets there, and he, uh, he goes out, he builds him a hut, the Lord gives him a gourd to cover his head, the gourd grew in the night, it died in the night, because the worm came and ate it. So the Lord gave him something, and then took it away from him, because Jonah's sitting there feeling sorry for himself, talking about how I'd be better off dead, than life. And, you know, the, eventually things worked out. But God told me, He said, Why shouldn't I spare these people? 120,000 people and their animals because they turned. And Jonah himself talked about God being merciful. That right there shows the mercy of the Lord. You got these wicked people out there. God could have destroyed them any time, but he sent them a messenger to warn them that this was coming. So, in the end, a lot of people got saved because Jonah obeyed, and I think sometimes if we do what the Lord wants us to, you know, it's going to have a good effect on people around us. Because God's got an intent to tell us to do something. The next book next minor prophet we're going to talk about is Malachi. And Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. And Malachi's name means my messenger. Now in Hebrew, Malachi, there's an A-H added at the end of his name. And that means God's messenger. And there is According to what I said and read, there is nothing known about Malachi's personal life. His prophet, what he prophesied, his, his prophecy was written down. Chapter 1, verse 1 of Malachi. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Now, the burden of the word means that this is a prophecy of either calamity or disaster. Now it's interesting how, you know, all these all these so-called minor prophets, they showed up. There's not good news here. They're all prophesying that, that we've read about is about destruction, <coughs> calamity, something bad to come. It's a warning. And the burden of the word, to think about burden, it's something heavy to carry. So Malachi is bringing this bad news. Verse 2. I have loved you, 
saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou led us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Saith the Lord, yet I love Jacob. Verse 3, And I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragon of the wilderness. Now, I had somebody one time, and this was many, many years ago. I was a teenager. I remember this conversation. There was somebody who was really upset with God because of that verse right there. God said, I hated Esau. And this person couldn't get by that. They thought it was wrong for God to hate somebody. And at that time, I had no answer. I mean, and, and until I studied this a little more, I really didn't understand this, but I looked this up. Hated Esau. It comes from the will of the Hebrew father to not give something to him. It's not the emotion of hate. However, Proverbs 6, 17 does say God hates a lying tongue, and Esau did that to get Jacob's birthright. So it's my understanding that a Hebrew father could have multiple sons. Now, the first son was always the most important. That, that's the way it was. Um, society and everything, that's the way their culture was. Number one son was a big deal. And it's not just uh, Hebrew. There are other cultures that way. But if a father decided to give something to one son and not give something to another son, it was spoken of that, well, he hated his the son he didn't give stuff to. So that's an odd way to put it, but I guess you think about a child. I got this, or you got this, and I didn't get this. Now I may have not even done that now. Also, that term dragons, most people will talk about dragons being just wild beasts of various kinds in the wilderness. Uh, that's what some scholars believe. Verse 4 Whereas Edom saith, We are impoverished. But we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, and I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath the indignation forever. Now, Edom was in southwestern Georgia, was where Edom was at, this, this territory. And uh, Edom said, we, we are in poverty. It's not a person. We are in poverty. But we will return and build a desolate place. Thus saith the Lord. But they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. I don't want to be on that side of the Lord, God. I don't want, it's scary enough, Mom and Daddy was mad at me when I was a child. I do not want to be on the wrong side of the Lord. Verse 5 says, And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. And what that means is that this territory of Eden. They can see Israel. You know, it'd be like if we went out to the top of 21 Mountain and looked down, and we could see down there, you know, State Road and Thurman and Elk and Jungle, all that down there getting blessed. We could see it. And it's like the border where they're at. So it's like the border of Israel. They're going to see this. Verse 6 says, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. And if I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts, unto you, O priests, that despise my name, and you say, 
wherein have we despised thy name? Verse 7 says, You offer polluted bread upon mine altar. And you say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In that you say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. You offered polluted bread upon my altar. Sacrifices had to be clean and pure, and, and you didn't bring in lame and blind animals and, and things like this to offer to the Lord. You're supposed to bring in the first fruits for sacrifices, no matter what it was. But that's not what they're doing here. They're offering polluted bread. You think about bread being life, you know, sustaining. Nobody wants to eat nasty bread. And certainly the Lord here, seeing them bring these things up to his altar to offer up to him, and he's like the table of the Lord is contemptible. And contemptible means to be loathed. Have you ever had somebody bring you something and you just look at it? It's like, wow. This is awful. <laughs> you know, it is. Uh, personally, with me, it's, it's, it's interesting to talk about polluted bread. You don't pollute bread for me. Burn it. I can't abide burnt bread. I don't care whether it's toast, peach crust, biscuit. I don't care. I don't like burnt bread. Now this year, they're bringing sacrifices to God here. And who knows what, looks, what this stuff looks like or what it is. Because verse 8 talks about this. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person, saith the Lord touch. You bring the Lord something that, that's cash that's not good. Go and give it to your governor over here. Give it to your leaders. Give it to anybody else above you. And see what they think about this. Are they going to want it? No. Why are you bringing it to the Lord? Verse 9 says, And now I pray you, beseech God, that he will be gracious unto us. This hath been by your means. Will he regard your persons? Saith the Lord. Beseech God. Pray that the Lord would still be gracious. By your means. Now, sometimes the Lord will understand if you don't have much to bring. You know, there are stories about and him's got a personal one of a child bringing basically weeds to the mom. And the mom is just so happy. And will take this and accept it. If that's the best you can do, okay, then the Lord has seen us. If that's the best you can do, that's fine. But you're expected to bring your best. And he knows what is the best. And if you're cranking up blind and, and wounded animals and all this stuff, bringing them in, and you got better stuff back at the house, the Lord's not going to accept it. And nobody else would if you got better. If you promised somebody a $100 bill and you showed up with a $5 bill, they're not going to be happy. You're not fulfilling the promise here. And these people were bringing who knows what at the altar. But they're praying now that the Lord would be gracious by your means. Will he regard your persons? Verse 10. Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for not? Neither do you kindle fire on mine altar for not. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. Now, these people, the priests here, are being pointed out. And it's like you won't even do the simplest things here without being rewarded for this. What, what's your desire here? What, what are you doing? What's your intention here? You're not worshiping 
the house of the Lord, you're worshiping your apostle. Or whatever. You're separate. If I do anything, I've got to be paid for. That was not their job. Their job was to take care of the house of the Lord. They were being taken care of by the people. But he got to the son of them were like, uh, it ain't enough. I need more. I need better. Verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the same, my name shall be great amongst the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name. And a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. So, So the Lord is saying here that from the rising of the sun, from the beginning of the day, to the going down of the day of the sun, my name will be great among the Gentiles, and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the people. So the Lord is saying here during the day, while the sun is up, his name is going to be great amongst the Gentiles. These are not his chosen people. These are the people who are grafted in. And Gentiles are simply everything else. If you weren't a Jew, you're a Gentile. We're Gentiles now. Every place incense shall be offered unto my name. Incense was used in the tabernacles and temple to send up a sweet smell uh, during, during prayer and everything, or during the sacrifices, because you can imagine what being around the slaughtered animals will be like. So I think that's the intent of incense. I may be wrong. But at least one reason for it is to have a sweet smell. And he's saying it be offered everywhere in his name. And a pure offering, which was not what they were doing over here earlier. And it says, And my name shall be great among the heathen. Saith the Lord of hosts, that's still going on today. Ask an atheist sometimes, why are they so mad at something they don't believe exists? They know he exists. That's why they're angry. The Lord here is saying that his name would be great among the heathen. Jesus' name. You know? And God's talking here, and people say, well, that's Jehovah. Well, that's true. But Jehovah, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit were all together from the beginning. Verse 12. But ye have profaned it, in that ye say the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. So it goes back to they're not satisfied. Now anybody close to me knows how much I like Amber. But there are people who want to stay there. And you offer them a hamburger, they look down at you. Now it seems to me this stuff is going on here that they feel like they're not being uh, given enough, rewarded enough. Verse 13, you said, Also behold, what a weariness it is. You have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And you brought that which was torn and the lame and the sick, thus she brought him as an offering. Can I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? Weariness it is. And ye have snuffed at it. You ever heard a horse? Just, just breathe real quick, breathe real hard. That, that's snuff. That, that's the sound of it. And what weariness it is, is it? So now they're complaining. They're not getting enough. They're tired. They don't want to do this. They're blowing. They're sitting around dragging their feet. It's like a tantrum here of this going on. And the Lord's talking about how this stuff's being brought into the house here. Should I accept this? 
And the last verse, no more reading. It'll be the last verse, chapter 1. The cursed be the seed, which hath in his flock of male, and vowed and sacrificed unto the Lord of corrupt things. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. And it all goes back to deceiver. You're bringing in stuff that's not to be sacrificed, but you're sacrificing it. And these people might be going around telling me, well, this is the best I've got. Well, you're deceiving people. You're lying. You got better at the home, but you're not bringing in here to, to give up to the Lord. And the last, the last line there, it says, My name is dreadful among the heathen. And it goes back to even the heathen knows God. And it is a dreadful thing for the heathen. His name is dreadful. They don't hear it. So I appreciate y'all listening.